Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all today. Please open in your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and chapter 19. We'll read from verse 7 to 14, and then also skip to chapter 19 and read uh, 19 through 21. Uh, it's in your bulletin there. It says 7 through 14. That's chapter 17. And then the, the bottom part where it says 19, that's chapter 19, verse 19. So just keep that in mind. Um, just a quick uh, word just to say hello. Uh, we have Joseph saying hello from uh, Etajima. He's, he's in Etajima for a little while. And his friend, uh, is it Val? Val. Yeah, he came. All right, welcome to our church. Thank you for coming. God bless you. I always say that if there are at least four testimonies, it's a good Sunday. And uh, there were at least four testimonies today. <laughs> And uh, I feel that it's a good Sunday. People are speaking from their heart. So that's a good thing. Uh, one more thing about our, myself and our family. Um, last Sunday, our daughter, Natami, uh, came down with a stomach virus. And so she was affected all week. It affected her voice and, and everything. And, also, our, the, the rest of our sons also got some kind of cold or virus. I also have a bit of a runny nose. And everybody got sick except for Nahomi. She was okay until last night. Uh, and she, she had some, some issues last night, uh, throwing up and just some things with her stomach. So just pray for our family like uh, we pray for yours just for health and strength in the changing season so yeah okay so let's begin our study uh, of Revelation today in chapter 17 and let me begin from verse 7 of chapter 17 please join me at chapter 19 verse 19 so I'll, I'll start then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads, the ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind of wisdom, with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, and now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven, and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings, who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. And they have one purpose, and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him, will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Let's read together chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. 
Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the, their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. And with these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword and coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This too is the word of God. Amen. Yeah. All right. We are here. The beast. Yeah. The false prophet. And we covered the prostitute and the woman last Sunday. Uh, actually, we covered the, the beast, the, the false prophet, and the mark of the beast a few months ago when we covered chapter 13. I encourage you, if you have your Bible with you or you have your own Bible app, be ready to go back to Revelation chapter 13 because that will contribute a lot to what we are going to say today. And if uh, it's confusing for you, don't worry. The Bible is what's called as meditative literature. It's not something that you read one time and you say, oh yeah, got it. Now what's next? No, 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 no. The Bible is something designed for you to read again and again and again, again. It's like a piece of hard candy. You put it in your mouth and you just let it melt for a long time slowly. So if you don't understand everything today, go back. Read again. Uh, I would encourage you, you can go back online to metakigc.com and you can see the sermon we preached on Revelation chapter 13. I think it will be helpful for you. Shameless plug. <laughs> so, uh, this week, I turned 42 years old. Yeah. Crazy, I know. Some of you, you're like, eh, 42, that was me 20 years ago. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 30 years ago, I was 12 years old. And as any 12-year-old boy is honest, he will say, I like kung fu movies. Uh, any kung fu movies. Bruce Lee, Jackie, Ter Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, Donnie Chan, anybody. And recently there was a movie, Kung Fu movie, produced and directed by the Kung Fu legend Keanu Reeves. And uh, the title of the movie is The Man of Tai Chi. Have you heard of it? Have you seen it? No? It's okay. Let me spoil it for you now. The Man of Tai Chi is about a, a man, a young man who studies the Chinese art of Tai Chi. Tai Chi, if you know, uh, is a slow uh, kind of movement and many senior citizens in China like to practice chi you know, Tai Chi and they're moving like this in the park and their hands and their body and their legs kind of have the movement of the wind and the water. Have you seen this? Tai Chi, yes. Okay. Well, this young man has studied Tai Chi with his master, and he is an expert. And of course, in a Kung Fu movie, the inciting incident is somebody threatens the thing he loves, his parents. And somebody is going to take away his parents' house and property. So he needs money to raise, to save his parents. 
So he has to join, of course, a kung fu tournament, right? And he goes to the kung fu tournament, and all the fighters in the kung fu tournament are, you know, tiger style and crane style and, you know, mantis style and, you know, all these dragon kung fu style, right? And he enters his specialty as Tai Chi. And the, the, the tournament is being, you know, broadcast with, you know, the color commentary, the commentators, you know. And they're saying, what? This man, he's an expert in Tai Chi? How can he fight? And the expert in martial arts says, well, actually, Tai Chi has two styles. There is the soft Tai Chi, and there is the hard Tai Chi. And you are familiar with the soft Tai Chi, but in order to protect yourself, sometimes you need the hard Tai Chi. Huh? And that's how the, the movie goes. And he's fighting, and he meets Keanu Reeves. And it's, it's great, great movie. If you're a man, and you like Kung Fu, I recommend, no, I don't recommend it. It's not good. Don't watch violent movies. Okay, so there is hard Tai Chi, and there is soft Tai Chi. Let's switch for a minute. When it comes to government and power and politics, there is what many sociologists will call hard power and soft power. And a government, in order to influence its people or influence the other governments around them, if they are the stronger government, if they are the power or the superpower, they have two ways to make other or lesser powers conform or submit to them. Those two ways are hard power and soft power. And so the hard power is do it our way, do what we tell you to do, do what we do what's best for us, or we have ships, we have planes, we have tanks, we have soldiers, we have guns, we have missiles, we have bombs. Hard power, yes? And then, for other countries, they don't use the hard power. The government will, will say, okay, for example, uh, the Vice President of the United States, he was in, I think, Indonesia at a summit of all the top uh, G7. He said this, he says, you know, the United States is happy to partner with you if you will partner with us. What does it mean? It's soft power. It's offering economic success, financial security, incentives for trade and exchange. But you do it for us. You do it our way. And we will do it to, to best benefit us. It's a carrot and a stick. Hard power and soft power. And what Revelation in chapter 7 teaches us as Christians is this. All throughout history, Christians will live under a power. A powerful mayor, a powerful governor, a powerful prime minister, a powerful president, a powerful uh, uh, emperor, a king, whatever it is. And Christianity will always be given the choice by that power or government or authority to submit or to give in. And they have a choice to meet two kinds of power, the hard power of the government or the soft power of the government. 
you can be a part of our society, you can join our society, our government, our people, but don't bring your Jesus. Caesar is Lord. You leave Jesus in your house or in your home, don't bring it to the business, don't bring it to the school, don't bring it to the court. Or, we'll take your school, we'll take your house, we'll take your family, we'll take you. Hard power, yes? Or the government or the power or the emperor will say, Oh yeah, you, you go ahead. You can you can you know follow this carpenter from Galilee, Jesus. Oh he rose from the dead. That's nice. Good for you. That's good. Okay, but as long as you come to our temple, you know, there are many gods, there are many deities, you know, there are many prophets. Jesus is one of them. That's good. And look, you know, it's it's only we you you just go ahead and, and you just have to put a little bit of incense. Just say a little bit of prayer to the emperor. And what's, what's wrong with that? You're fine. And what will happen? You'll have your family. You'll have your work. You'll have your company. You can do business. You can join, you know, there's nothing wrong. You'll have, you'll have, clo you'll have nice clothes. You'll have nice food. Your children will go to the nice schools. Just fine. It's soft power. So the hard power comes from the beast. And the beast, as we saw in chapter 13, has two forms. Okay? And actually, we see it here. Two forms. The first beast uh, is the one that the woman is riding. Uh, verse 7, I will explain the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides. And it has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast, in chapter 13, was the beast that came out of the sea. And the sea is a symbol in scripture of chaos, of violence, of disorder. And that is often what is against God. Isaiah chapter 53. The wicked are like the sea, churning up the, the violence and wickedness. And so the beast comes out of that, and he has um, seven heads, ten horns. The beast looks just like the dragon, the serpent, from chapter 13. The dragon, the serpent, had seven heads, ten horns. And what happened was, the dragon goes against God, goes against all God's purposes by going against God's people. By threatening them through death, persecution, and suffering. So, that's the beast coming out of the deep, the seas. Now, uh, there's this thing that is interesting about the beast. And we see it in chapter, er, verse 8, chapter 17. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast. <clears throat> because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. Do you see that pattern? Once was, now is not, and yet will come. Once was, now is not, yet will come. That happens three times in our passage today. We read it three times. That's not the first time you see that pattern. Actually, in chapter 1, verse 8 of Revelation, talking about God, Jesus is the one who was, who is, and is to come. And then... In Revelation chapter 4, we see a, the throne room of heaven and we see Jesus high and lifted up. The angels are crying, holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. Do you see the pattern? This beast is trying to copy 
the pattern of Jesus. Right? But it's different, isn't it? He, he was, now is not, and yet will come. So a little bit different, right? What's the difference there? All right? We read in chapter 13 that the people are amazed because this beast had a, a mortal wound on its head. And it died. And then it came back to life. And so there's a lot of uh, theory or commentary or a lot of study. People saying, well, you know, Nero, the emperor, who was in power at the time of the scripture, he had a rumor. He killed himself with an, you know, he committed suicide and he was dead. And then there was a rumor in Rome that he came back to life. Maybe that's who it is. Maybe. Uh, but we understand here, there's something more about the beast that's copying the pattern of Jesus, who once was and who is and is to come. There's another thing. In Revelation chapter 13, go ahead, open your Bible, turn back to Revelation 13. Okay. Something there. Verse... Uh, well, oh, we can just, just verse 5, Revelation verse, uh, 13, chapter 13, verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months, three and a half years. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. So the beast is like the dragon against God. We continue. Verse 7, it was given power to wage war against God's holy people, to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and time. So it, was, it had power throughout the whole earth. Verse 8, all the, inhabitants, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Do you see the language? It's just like what we read in chapter 17. Yeah? Very similar. He, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay. Now, what we understand from this beast is the beast gives power, excuse me, the dragon gives power to the beast. And the beast gets all the people to worship itself and the beast makes all the people worship the dragon so the beast is in the service of the dragon right Jesus came and Jesus says I don't speak on my own authority everything I say comes from the father so the father gives the son the authority gives the Son the words. And the people worship the Son. Christians follow after Jesus and they give their life to Jesus. And in doing so, they give glory to God. Now the beast wants to copy Jesus and so he wants everybody to worship him and worship the image of the dragon. So we see here an imitation and a false copy of Christ. So we call the beast this. This is another word for the beast the copy of Christ, the opposite of Christ, the anti-Christ. You follow? Is there only one anti-Christ? Go back. Okay, you don't have to go back farther to 1st John. Just keep going left in your Bible. 1st John. 1st John. This is the same John who wrote Revelation. And in 1st John chapter 18, oh, excuse me, chapter 2, 1 John, chapter 2. If you're there, say amen. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 18. Here's what he says. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Many Antichrists have come. Plural. You see? The beast, 
is the spirit of the Antichrists. Hear me. John is not talking about one emperor, one power, one government. John is talking about powers, principalities, authorities, governments that put themselves against the people of God. That's the spirit of the Antichrists. Let me demonstrate that a little bit more. And I'm going to get to you. I promise you. I will get back to where you are, where you live. We go back to Revelation 17. This calls for a mind of wisdom. Chapter, or verse 9. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are all seven kings. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen once... One is, the other is not yet to come. But when he does, he must remain only for a little while. Okay, what are these seven heads, these ten horns? What are these seven hills? Well, Rome was known as the colony. When it first, before it was an empire, it was a colony. It was the colony of uh, seven cities built on the seven hills on the left side of the Tiber River. Everybody knew this. This is, this is a, a, a picture of Rome, the seven hills. And yet, John, a master storyteller, poetry of the highest order, he understands in the Bible, mountain or hill is an image of a high place, a place of power, governments. So these seven hills were seven kings. Well, who are these seven kings? Well, here's what a lot of people have said. You start with Julius Caesar. Next is Augustus. Augustus. After that, Tiberius. After that, Caligula. Claudius. Nero. Galba. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. From Julius Caesar to Caesar Galba, you have seven. The problem is, after that, is Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian, and Nerva. All within a span of a hundred years. So which of these 13 are the seven heads, or the seven kings? And so a lot of people do the math. They start with Julius Caesar and they end with Galba. No, 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 no. You don't need Caesar. You start with Augustus and you go to Otho. No, 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 no. Galba and Otho, they only had a five-month five reign and then they got killed and it's only a short... And so you go... Too much math. This is apocalyptic scripture. This is symbolic language. He's talking about powers and authorities that continue. The point where he is making here is not who are these heads and who are these kings. The point is this. We read it again. They're here now, but there's going to be more. Their one is now, but then another is coming, but his time is short. Their one is now, but ten more are going to be coming, and their time is going to be short. In other words, the suffering, the persecution, the difficulty you have now, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. And in chapter 14, he says this. He says, this calls for patience and endurance for the people of God. It calls for patience and and endurance for the people of God. The number 10, 10 kings. It's a number of completeness and totality of power. Back in, in Revelation chapter 3, it says that the, 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 the mayor of the city, or excuse me, Satan, will allow the church to suffer 10 days. Right? And there's other things that were ten that, that, that call up uh, suffering and persecution and evil for ten days. In other words, it's limited. And here's the thing. We read in chapter 13, it was 42 months, three and a half years. That's a half of seven. Seven is the total number of completeness. And God says, no, your suffering will not be, 
You're, it's going to be a complete suffering, but I'm going to cut it off at three and a half years. There's progressions and there's numbers, and it's okay. You don't have to remember all of it. The point he's saying is this. It continue, what, that beast, that beast itself, isn't it weird? It said that he is one of the seven kings, and in fact, he's the eighth king. Did you see that? So it's just going to continue and continue and continue. But there's one more beast, and then we've got to go to the end. The one more beast in, in chapter 17 was... Verse 14. Verse 14. Oh, no, 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 excuse me. We'll go to the end. Skip down to chapter 19, excuse me. Chapter 19. So the beast and the kings of the earth, the armies gathered together to wage war against the rider and his horse. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet. So chapter 19, verse 20. With it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. So there's the beast, and there's the false prophet. The false prophet was the second beast in Revelation 13. Revelation 13 had two beasts, one from the sea, the other from the land. The one from the land was deceptive, tricky. It performed miracles. It fooled the people of God. This is the soft power of religion. Revelation is also telling us maybe you're not political. Maybe you don't care about economics and finances. Maybe you reject the world. Maybe you're all about the power of God. Maybe you're religious. And you think it's all about heaven and the future. This earth, it's going to pass away. It's going to go to hell. So let me just read my Bible and bury my head and ignore everybody else. Let me look at every YouTube video that has people being healed. Let me find every preacher that promises wealth, and my best life now because of God's favor on me. And let me just be religious. Let me post on Facebook every scripture, every inspirational quote, every pseudo gospel. It's a false prophet. Revelation is very clear. It calls for a mind of wisdom. It calls for a mind of wisdom. Christians are not to be fools giving themselves up to the hard power, to the soft power, or the false prophet. Watch this. There's the serpent, the beast, and the false prophet. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Trinity of God, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God. And there's the unholy trinity, the copycat trinity, the unholy, evil triumvirate of the serpent, the beast, and the false prophet. Did you watch that? Did you see that? It's all right there. And John is saying, it calls for a mind of wisdom. Now the good news. We go. They wage war against the lamb, the rider on the horse. Okay, see there in verse 19? The rider on the horse. Now, I want to just show you who that rider is. We didn't have time to, or we didn't have space to put it all on the screen, so it's okay. You have it in your Bibles. So now, turn to uh, chapter 19 in your Bible. Okay, chapter 19. And I'm going to get closer to you sooner than you think. Who is this rider? So, uh, verse 11 of chapter 19. Verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and before me was a white horse, 
whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Who is that? Yeah. Now, you want to see something cool? Start with verse 11 once more. And how many ways does he describe Jesus? How many ways does he describe Jesus? Okay, he's called faithful and true. One, he judges and wages war. Two, his eyes are blazing fire. Three, on his head are many crowns. Four, his name is, is written no one knows but he himself. Five, he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Six, his name is the word of God. Seven. Pretty cool, huh? John knows what he's doing. This is Jesus, none other. This is a complete description of his power, his authority, his holiness, his greatness. This is God whom we worship. That's why he's king of kings and lord of lords. Now, I can't stay on this for a long time, but I just encourage you. Oh, I encourage you now. Look at these seven descriptions of Jesus. Reflect on it. Think on it. You have seven days from now until next Sunday. Pick one a day. Spend five minutes thinking about the name that no one else knows but him. Think about the eyes that are blazing fire. Think about the name of faithful and true. Just let you, just chew on it for five minutes one day. And see how it does to change your heart, to change your mind, to change your perspective on your life, on your situation. I encourage you to do that. It will, it will, it will benefit you. I know. Trust me. But that's the writer, okay? So the writer is Jesus. And uh, he goes on to explain a little bit more about him. But we go down to verse 19, or verse 20, verse 20. The beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. And with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Okay, no time to go over the mark of the beast uh, and all that. That was in chapter 13. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning fire. That's where we get our title of our sermon today. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The beast and the false prophet were overthrown. They had power, they had authority, they had influence over all the kings of the earth. They were overthrown by the victorious lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider and the horse. So the sword is coming out of the mouth. What does that mean? That means Jesus has the authority to speak judgment. Only Jesus has the authority to decide who is saved, who is not, who is his, and who does not belong to him. Jesus knows the heart. He has that authority. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Kind of a graphic way to end the, the chapter. It's like... He, you want to say shout hallelujah, but it's like, whoa, <laughs> birds gorging themselves. What is this? Why? Well, actually, you'd understand uh, if I told you in context. The beginning of chapter 19 also begins with a feast. Now, the beginning of chapter 19 is about a wedding feast. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he's saying the ones who were invited to the wedding feast are actually the guest of honor, the bride. The lamb makes those who he invites to the feast the bride of the feast, right? And you can enjoy the glory, the beauty, the majesty, the pleasure, the satisfaction of the lamb of the rider. And the people feasted themselves. That's the picture of heaven. 
coming down, right? And then it ends, chapter 19, of a different feast of all the animals. Actually, it's from, it's from Ezekiel. Ezekiel had this vision, same kind of vision. So he's, he's hyperlinking back to Ezekiel. But it's another feast of all the birds and all the beasts gorging themselves on the enemies of the Lamb. Right? So there's a parallel there. But I need to get to the gospel. The gospel was actually uh, back where we read in verse 13. In verse 13 of chapter 19. It's not up here. It's not in your bulletin. But here's the gospel. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Many people can say this blood is the blood of the enemies of Jesus. And it makes sense in the context. Absolutely. He treads the winepress of God's wrath. But here's the thing. He treads the winepress of God's wrath after this. He actually appears first and before he starts judging, before he captures the beast, before they're overthrown and thrown into the lake of fiery sulfur, before all of that, his blood is already on his robes. I just gave it away. His blood is already on the robe. So if it's not the blood of the enemies, it's his blood. Another way that the Greek shows it is not dipped in blood, it's splattered in blood. And in the next verse, it says, the robes of the ones with Jesus are all white. Do you see the gospel? Our robes are white because his robe is red. We can have white robes, pure robes, holy, righteous robes, because he took our filth and our guilt and our shame. His robe is already red. That is the victory of Jesus. The victory of Jesus is going to be at the second coming, where he comes in power with the angels and with, with the force of heaven to judge his enemies. And my dear friends, find him, run to him, run away from sin, repent, turn back and away from those patterns, those thoughts, those sins of, of your attitude and your heart and your actions, and run to the Lamb. He bled for you. Put your faith in His blood. But not only that, if, you're, if you already know Him, and you love Him, and you cling to His robe, this is His promise to you. I love uh, how Darcy picked the song this week. A mighty fortress is our God. Do you know that song was written about Revelation chapter 19? Martin Luther, studying this book, understanding that when he was going to go up against the Roman church and the persecution he was going to find and the difficulties that he was about to face, this was the song that comforted him based on Revelation 19. Listen, Revelation is applicable, it's practical, it applies now, today. Right on time, Art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we close with this. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's hard to understand sometimes. But I know one thing. Life is not easy. It's hard. And some of you, some of us, are in a season right now. We're not necessarily facing the hard power, but there's the temptation of the soft power. And then there's just life beating us up. And then some of us, we understand 
there's a power behind the power. The serpent is attacking us through all the things he has, his lies, his deceptions, his servants, their works, and their effects. He will speak to us and say, you're not worth it. He will whisper to you in your bed saying, who do you think you are? He will let, get right in your face and, say, and laugh right at you saying, are you kidding me? You're ridiculous, you and your little Christian faith. And so what do we sing? A mighty fortress is our God. I'm learning a song this week. It's a cute little song. It's not as great as uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It goes like this. I got the V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. I've got no reason to fear. I've got Jesus on my side. I've got that, hey, I've got that Jesus. I've got the V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. I've got Jesus on my side. I've got nothing to fear. If you're in a season, if you're in a place right now, I know. Look, here's what my, my last bit of advice. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's difficult. Don't focus on the difficulty. Focus on the God. Focus on the Lamb. Look and understand what the season is. The devil stares you in the face. He roars like a lion, but Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will overthrow the beast along with the Babylon, along with the prostitute, along with the false prophet, and next week, along with the serpent. Yeah, we'll get there too. But focus. Look to Jesus. Look to the cross. Look to him who is on the white horse, the rider. Look at him the whole time. And don't take your eyes off him. Don't. Tomorrow when you wake up, look to the rider on the white horse. Tonight when you go home, look to the rider on the white horse. I got the V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. I've got no reason to fear. I've got Jesus on my side. Uh, Anthony... Jones is the name of the artist, if you want to YouTube that. Okay. So, let's go to him now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask now for you to open up our mind to understand the word you have given us. Give us the wind of wisdom because you said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. Lord, we need wisdom. We need insight. We need understanding that's only found in you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let your word guide us and lead us throughout this week. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.